Hi, David. Thanks for joining me, friend. Hey, Tosh, and how's it going? It is going well. Uh, happy to be here with you. So for some context, um, I took your course on EDM production earlier this year at Fractal, and that kind of helped me get started with my own music production journey. And then we ended up becoming friends and we did a track together. And uh, yeah, I just thought it'd be cool to have you on the podcast and get to know you better in that way and share your lovely heart with the world. So um, yeah, I'll start by asking you the question I ask everyone, which is about your life story. Mm, for me, this is really, I mean, this whole podcast is an opportunity to get to know people better, both a specific person and who they are in their life and to understand where they're coming from and what they care about, but also people as a whole, like us as a species and who we are and how we work and what we care about. And often there are specific things that I'm interested in talking to people, like in our case, EDM and music and stuff. Um, but I also love to frame that in the context of who someone is and their whole life and what they care about and what, how they came to care about that specific thing or yeah, all of that. So I'd love to hear from you about your life so far and feel free to answer this in any way you want, uh, short, long, uh, an epic tale or a brief account. It's all good. Whatever you'd like to share is what I'd love to hear. I could sing a song about it. Too, exactly. Let's go. <laughs> all right. Um, well, it's great to be here on the podcast with you. Um, you know, you were a really fantastic student in my class too, very dedicated. You actually did all the homework and even went above and beyond. So um, it was really validating for me as an instructor when you, uh, when we were able to, you know, get in the studio together and make a track together. And it wasn't just like, you know, me doing all the work and, and, you know, you just being there, it actually felt like an honest to goodness uh, collaboration. And I think it's, maybe the best track I've ever done. So uh, thank you for um, making that possible for me. Wow. So cool. life story. Um, where to start? Uh, well, I was born in Pensacola, Florida. Um, that's a uh, panhandle, the Gulf Coast. It's actually so far west that it's in central time, unlike the rest of Florida. So already a little quirked up there. Um, and it's not a very big city, maybe 50,000 people. Um, so, you know, definitely relatively quiet, but a good, I'd say a good place for a kid to grow up. Um, you know, not a lot of distractions, not a lot of danger. Um, just like a, you know, solid kind of beach town to grow up in. Um, but I will say I didn't really take as much advantage of the beach as I could have when I was growing up there. You know, I, I always thought of myself as more of an indoor kid. I like the air conditioning. Um, I like computers and video games and stuff like that. So like in high school, I would have friends that would go to the beach to go surfing at like 430 in the morning before school and then and then come and then show up at school like 720 a.m. I'm like, how do y'all how do y'all even do that? Like, like, I would I would always stay up super late doing all my homework. But in any case, um, yeah, so grew up in Pensacola. Um, uh, I sang in the church choir with uh, my mom, dad, sister, and uh, grandfather on my mom's side. So um, especially for the first half of my life, or first like, mm, yeah, half, I guess, all the way through high school, um, it was very, uh, had a lot of connection to uh, Christ Church in Pensacola. Um, we went, my sister and I both went to a, a K3 through eighth grade school that was like across the street from the church and affiliated with it. Um, um, actually, my first exposure to computers was because my dad, who's an accountant, bought an IBM PC, like one of the first personal computers, mass market personal computers from the 80s. Uh, he got one so he could help the church do their taxes and or sorry, help the school do their taxes and get their finances in order. Um, and, you know, there were some it had some games on it. I also learned a little bit of uh, basic programming. Um, I remember being, yeah. Quite, ta quite taken with that uh, piece of machinery. Um, so, you know, I did, I did what kids in, in uh, growing up in the suburbs typically do, you know, I took swim lessons, uh, I played various sports, you know, a lot of baseball. Um, I think that was probably because uh, dad played baseball growing up. Honestly, it wasn't really like my sport. 
kind of wish we'd realized that sooner. Um, turns out that basketball is actually the, the sport I was, I was uh, more interested in. So um, ended up playing uh, in eighth grade and ninth and 10th grades. Um, and that was after like, I spent like the whole summer after seventh grade, like, like training so I could get on the basketball team in my middle school um, and hard work paid off. Um, and that kind of actually, now that I'm thinking about it, it's sort of a microcosm for a lot of these kind of opportunities in my life where I like saw something that I wanted and I went after it. Um, also played a good amount of soccer growing up as well. Um, that was going to be my backup plan in case I didn't make the basketball team in ninth grade, but, um, you know, fortunately I did. So, um, got to play basketball. Uh, and that was an interesting experience too, because, um, so I went to this, um, I went to an IB, an international baccalaureate magnet program in high school. And it was situated inside Pensacola High School, which was uh, based downtown. So um, kind of in a lower income area. Uh, actually, all the pr pretty much everyone from my middle school, which was a private religious school, religious affiliated school, um, they either went to the private Catholic high school for graduation or they went to uh, Washington High School, which is also where my sister went. And that is kind of like people who lived in the neighborhood I lived in were districted for that school. But um, you know, everyone knew that IB was like the best sort of academic program in uh, Pensacola. So naturally that's where I went. Um, and I got the chance to, from playing on the basketball team, I got the chance to interact with a lot of people that I would never have otherwise encountered. Um, you know, getting to to go on, on bus trips uh, with these other students to um, play at different basketball camps. Um, you know, hard to say anything like explicit about did like what that may have given me, but I feel like, you know, just the exposure to a broader range of people probably was, you know, helpful for my psyche in some way. Um, and actually that, that pattern kind of will end up repeating in college in a, in a, in a different sort of way. Um, let's see, what else can I say about, um, growing up in Pensacola? Um, yeah, it was a, uh, you know, like I said, I was mostly an indoor kid. I also started to get the sense that I wanted to live in a big city, like a, a proper metropolis. Um, I feel like, you know, Pensacola was nice, but it's also kind of limiting. Like, it's not exactly a cultural tour de force. Um, you know, it is, it's kind of the cult, it's kind of part of the cultural South. Um, if you go geographically further South in Florida, you get to places like Miami, which, kind of have a different sort of culture but you know Pensacola um they call us the Emerald Coast they also call us the Redneck Riviera uh so we sometimes get lumped in with like or you know reasonably get lumped in with Alabama and Georgia and so on um so I wanted to experience like you know big city life and so when I started applying to colleges I was looking at places like Harvard and MIT in Boston or Columbia in New York, which is where I ultimately ended up going, or even like Georgia Tech in Atlanta, Northwestern near Chicago. Um, so got into Columbia, the engineering school there. And, uh, you know, at age 18, I went off to the big city. So that was kind of like the first major half of my life. And the second half of my life up until today has been uh, dominated by uh, New York City, or, you know, that's, that's where I've been uh, living in or near for the second half of my life thus far. Um, so I went to Columbia, was, uh, de uh decided I was going to be a mechanical engineering major, not based on a whole lot other than vibes. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I was good at math. I was good at physics. I did math team growing up in, uh, you know, when I was in high school and, uh, actually in middle school, I even won some countywide math competitions, um, as a seventh and eighth grader. So for a while there, I was like the best math student in Pensacola, uh, for whatever that's worth. Um, actually, I also, another thing that I should mention is I, I did a lot of, uh, quiz bowl in high school, also called scholars bowl or academic team. Basically they ask you like academic trivia questions, like who wrote this book or, uh, you know, who fought what two sides fought in these wars, those kind of things. Um, so I'd spend like three and a half hours every Saturday, Again, probably when my other friends were surfing, uh, <laughs> memorizing uh, like who painted this work of art or who composed this uh, piece of classical music. So really kind of 
setting the the tone for what my personality is. Um, but anyway, I went to went to Columbia Engineering School. Um, decided to major in mechanical engineering because I wanted a job after graduation. I thought that would give me good job prospects, and I was good at physics and math. Uh, fortunately, they made us take an intro to computer science class, and I did really well in it. So I was like, hey, why don't I get a minor in computer science? This is fun. Um, and you know, looking back, it is obvious to me that I should have just majored in computer science because uh, I ended up doing like my best GPA was in all my comp sci classes. I think if I'd had more like mentors growing up that you know, just examples of people making a living doing computer programming, maybe I wouldn't have been um, seduced by the uh, allures of mechanical engineering. Because honestly, I'm not even that practically minded in terms of like working with things with my hands, you know, probably better than average, but not like, not like some of my friends in that major who were, you know, who went on to work at, you know, Raytheon or, or, Rivian or place, you know, places where they're actually doing real uh, mechanical engineering. Um, but my my grandfather, on my dad's side uh, was an engineer in the army. He worked at uh, Honeywell. And so that was that was probably a very salient example to me. So I was thinking, you know, OK, mechanical engineering. But anyway, so um, fortunately, I minored in computer science and that ended up helping me out when I was trying to uh, when I was graduating, I was trying to stay in the city. Uh, that was like just my main goal, like just get some kind of job in the city. Um, doesn't really doesn't really matter too much if it's mechanical engineering or what. And uh, um, that's when I learned just how like lopsided the demand was, because, you know, I would I would send out my resume to all sorts of mechanical engineering jobs, wouldn't hear a peep. But then I would like email a programming jo uh, shop in class and then five minutes later i'd get invited to do a phone call with them so like that was sort of a wake-up call maybe if i had taken advantage of academic advising i would have figured that out sooner but um you know who's to say um and while i'm on the topic of engineering i mentioned that you know in high school i played basketball and that exposed me to a bunch of other different people in college i um columbia has this um, annual theater production called the varsity show. They basically get a bunch of students to put on a big musical production. That's kind of based around Columbia, its culture, current events. Um, I think it originally started as like a fundraiser for our uh, sports teams, which, uh, I don't know if more money is going to help them. They need, they need something else, maybe Jesus. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, I saw it, my, my, um, uh, freshman year of college and I was like oh my god I want to be a part of that and so I started playing piano and keyboards for for any musical I could get my hands on there you know theater production show and so I got to meet a whole bunch of um, theater people uh, very little overlap with my engineering friends uh, I think there was one guy who was a civil engineer and he later became an Imagineer at Disney which is kind of like the perfect job for him you know being a, a engineering minded theater kid um, but that was really great to get to, you know, continue honing and honing my musical skills and, um, uh, uh, expressing them really, um, also opened up some random interesting opportunities. Like I got to play piano for Lucy Simon, who wrote the musical, um, secret garden. Cause we did a production of that. And I think she was friends with our director, mom or something and came to see the show. And she was like, Oh, who's, who's that pianist? We're kind of putting together a. We want to maybe do a simplified version of the score for people to play. So I got to like go over to her apartment, play my own versions of these tracks. Cause I was really kind of winging it. Like a lot of times with these, you know, I had tons of classwork, of course, and then very compressed schedule to learn all the music. So a lot of the times I was just kind of winging it or making up, you know, playing something that was approximately what was in the score. It's not like, not like the audience would notice that I wasn't hitting every single note precisely as written in the score. And um, there's actually probably a, a life lesson there about not being too precious about one's um, artistic expression. You know, just like um, you're the one that knows the most about what's going on musically. 
I mean, maybe in certain rarefied cases, like with classical music, where you have like art critics listening carefully, they they might be noticed. But for the most part, people aren't paying attention as carefully as you think. And so you don't need to kill yourself trying to make things perfect. It can be, you know, good enough for that matter. But I mean, for me, there's always this internal artistic tension. I, I know one of your later questions is going to be about like, what makes me feel satisfied with my music. And, you know, I do have... <clears throat> this perfectionist streak where I want to make it sound perfect in my head. And that, I mean, not to sound too pretentious, but probably I assume a lot of artists have that drive within them to, cause they have like this very clear vision that they're trying to achieve. And it doesn't matter as much like what the audience thinks necessarily. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so I played, played piano and keyboards for a lot of musicals, um, got to meet a lot of great people. Um, actually, I eventually met my wife through a party that was in a long series of sort of these weekend house getaway parties uh, that my theater friends were throwing. So you could say I never would have met her if I hadn't done all this, um, uh, you know, played in all these shows. So, um, you know, music can change your life. <laughs> um, what else? Uh, yeah, so so it came time to graduate. Um, didn't have any, I, you know, I had a couple internships, but like nothing really too, too fancy. Uh, actually, one summer, I just, the uh, summer after my sophomore year, I just went back home to Pensacola and played in a band like once a week at a restaurant. And so I guess that was my first brush with the sabbatical life um, or, you know, taking, taking time off from work to, to focus on um, other parts of my personality that I want to stoke and all we'll get to another instance of that in a little bit but um uh so eventually i i managed to snag a job at this uh finance company called alliance bernstein um i actually had to apply twice so i applied once my um fall semester of senior year i think i interviewed and then didn't pass but meanwhile my my roommate and really good friend uh nick uh, bornstein he he did get a job with them and then in spring semester, they were looking for more applicants. So uh, I just reapplied. But this time I had uh, I had tuned up my cover letter. Thanks to another friend of mine, Stanley, who uh, he works at Stripe. Um, and I, I don't know if they just were OK with interviewing me again or they didn't notice that they had interviewed me again. But, you know, in the meantime, I had practiced a bit more um, of the you know kind of technical interview questions that they ask and um, managed to get the job offer. Um, you know, it wasn't glamorous. It was doing internal software development for, you know, to support their, um, not the traders even, just like the, uh, uh, just, I don't know, the core part of their business is asset management. And I was in a, more of a support role. So, uh, but, you know, got my toe in the industry, got to stay in New York. Um, I moved to Chelsea with, with my friend Nick and we lived there for, um, well, I ended up living there for something like eight years. He uh, he left after about a year to go to California to to start doing startups, which you know very much in line with his personality. But um, yeah, so then you know after about a year of that, I kind of had progressed in my skills further, and I was able to actually to get a job at like a, a real software company. In this case, uh, Factset Research Systems. They make a um, they make like a financial terminal similar to Bloomberg, but you know, there they actually had real software engineering practices. Like when you would sync the code down for the first time and compile it, it would actually build. And oh, we have tests that your code needs to pass, and we do code review. So, um, you know, definitely an upgrade in the level of professionalism. Um, also, another place I had to apply to twice because. Uh, when I applied in college, I didn't uh, pass their interview, but a year later, I was able to. Um, um, the whole time, though, I I uh, I kind of had my eye on Google. So <clears throat> I remember seeing this video in high school, I think, of like inside the Google New York office. And it looked so cool, right? People zooming around on scooters, crazy decorations on the walls, free food in the in the in the cafeterias. I was like, man, that would be a really cool place to work. Too bad it's not going to happen for me, probably, because I'm 
going down a different path. But then I sort of, I guess I got caught in its gravitational well. Um, uh, the the apartment in Chelsea that that we moved to was like three blocks from the office, and you know, with them, I I applied once, didn't get it. Applied another time, I didn't get it. And then I had like one more vacation day um, in the year at Fax, and I was like let's let's give it one more shot and uh, the recruiter even told me like okay so this is like the third time you've applied so you know if you don't get it this time probably not gonna <laughs> probably not gonna be able to move forward with your candidacy for a while unless something drastically changes <laughs> so um uh but you know fortunately i uh you know kept studying i actually picked up a a, a moonlighting gig to well first of all to earn extra money to help pay off my student loans um, but second, to gain some more experience and, you know, facility with this programming language called Python and, um, and also, you know, continue to study a lot in my, in my spare time. Cause again, I also had some ground to make up here, you know, having only minored in computer science, I didn't have quite as much exposure to the sorts of, um, topics that they, that they ask about. Um, I didn't have any like internships at these big tech companies that would kind of acculturate me to what to expect in these kind of interviews. So I sort of had to uh, do it on my own. Um, but third time was the charm. <laughs> Actually, they even made me do two phone interviews that time because I guess the first one didn't give enough signal. So, uh, but yeah, you know, it doesn't matter what, what roadblocks are in front of me. I will find a way to bust through if I really uh, care about care about the end result. So finally felt like, you know, when I got that offer in hand, it was like electrifying. I felt like I'd finally been admitted into the cathedral of computer science. Um, and that's where I stayed for the next eight years. Now, in the meantime, um, was still doing music stuff. Um, I, I dabbled in this one band. Um, and I think the current, I think the, um, singer from that band is, went on tour with Broadway at some point he was very serious about it he like wanted us to have all these like thea theatrical elements to our shows um and for me it kind of I kind of fizzled out on it just because it's like very annoying to have to carry your equipment all around the city uh you know especially you know it could be heavy carrying it around on the subway I I, I see musicians wheeling their cellos around or whatever and my heart goes out to them um but that's kind of when I started, um, you know, picking back up on the computer music thing. So I'd always been, you know, using computers to, to facilitate my music ever since at least high school, maybe even a little bit in middle school, but like I would, um, in, in uh, high school, I won this comp, the statewide composition contest in Florida, um, you know, um, programming drums and other instruments in, uh, a piece of software called Cakewalk. I would I would play stuff in on my keyboard, like record it in to the computer. Um, you know, didn't sound that professional, but I guess for a high schooler entering this school-based uh, music composition contest, it was fine. Um, maybe I'll even backtrack a little bit further. At the um, when I was thirteen, I you know I'd been taking classical piano lessons for a while now since I was seven. Um, you know, at the initial urging of my dad, but, you know, as a kind of a, I think I have a tendency to want to please my parents, um, not that uncommon in kids. And so I was like, sure, let's do it. And I already, you know, we already had the, the musical context of our, um, family to kind of encourage that. Um, but I was kind of getting a little burnt out on it. Like, you know, I'd prepare these pieces and then I would sometimes play some of them at recitals or sometimes I wouldn't. And I kind of was just thinking like, why am I spending all this time learning this instrument? I don't know. Um, but then I remember reading a forum post about using Winamp, I think, to, to slow down music so you could transcribe it. And the poster gave an example of the song Overture 1928 by Dream Theater. Uh, and I was like, hmm, let me check that out. Cause this is in the days of Napster. Uh, so you could, you know, I would just download music from Napster. Um, uh, and I heard the song and I was just like completely blown away. Like, oh my God, where has the sound been all my life? 
Um, like prior to that, I pretty much only listened to classical music and Weird Al. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't really interested in the music that was on the radio. Um, and they never played Weird Al on the radio. Go figure. Um, but uh, yeah, when I heard that song by Dream Theater, I just listened to it on repeat, like over and over and over again. It was just, I could like, and, and specifically there's this one part where the keyboardist does Jordan Rudis does this crazy like solo. And I was just obsessed with the, with the sound he was getting. So then I was like, okay, if I can use, if I can use my piano skills to do that sort of thing. Now I kind of understand why I would want to do this. And that helped, you know, reignite my fire. Um, ended up going to music camp a couple summers. Um, spent, spent a lot of time on the Jordan Rudis forums. Um, like, they would they would post these backing tracks where it was just like the background instruments and then people would play their own solos on top of them and uh my dad and i would would record our own and then post it on uh on the forums for people to listen um and that actually led to maybe my first brush with celebrity so senior year or i guess summer after junior year i was at um i was at music camp brevard music center and uh, my dad and my bandmates were going to come pick me up because we were going to go stop by in Atlanta afterwards to see this uh, touring metal show called Gigantor. Um, and Dream Theater was performing there and, and Megadeth and some other folks. And we get there and dad was like, hey, we're gonna, we need to stop by Will Call first. And I was like, OK. And they gave us backstage passes. And I was like, what's going on here? Like, I thought those were sold out or like for some reason we couldn't get them. And it turns out dad had reached out to the webmaster of Jordan Rudis's forum. It was like, hey, my son and his band really wants to, would love to meet the band. We can't get, you know, all the tickets are sold out. Is there anything you could do? So then he talked to Jordan and Jordan was like, yeah, sure. You know, put, we'll put your name on the list. So, um, you know, my dad always encourages me to, to ask for things and just, you know, give things a shot. Because if you don't ask, you definitely won't get and uh, you'd be surprised at how willing uh, people are to help you out. I mean, especially for kids, you know, I think people really want to help out kids, but even, you know, even as adults. Um, and that also, I guess, was an early lesson in the magic of the internet for making things happen and making uh, uh, connections possible that weren't otherwise, that wouldn't otherwise be happening, as you well know. Um, so, so yeah, so um and by the way, that, all that skill I developed playing classical music is what allowed me to play in all those musicals in, in college in the first place. So anyway, so uh, we're we're now post-graduation. Um, I stopped playing the band. I started to focus more on like music production again. So I had a friend who made some uh, flash animations His name Jake is Jake Hollander. Um, uh, he, he, he was entering this contest on Newgrounds, which was still relevant at the time. Might still be, but it was before Flash was too much of a security issue and they still had all their Flash animations on there. Um, so I did some uh, some of the background music and sound effects for some of his animations. One of them actually got like 100,000 views. It was uh, like a parody of the movie 300, but with uh, where all the characters were numbers and it <laughs> was like a battle of odd versus even or something. Uh, that was a really fun project to work on. That's probably still the th piece of work of mine that has been heard the most musically speaking really random you know i've released plenty of music since then that i think is better but um you, know, <laughs> you never know you never know what's going to get picked up by the maw of the internet um but i still really didn't know too much of what i was doing in terms of like pro music production um but i, I want to say in like maybe 2015 or 16, I, I started watching a lot of YouTube videos on like production techniques. I learned about this website called Splice, which you're not familiar with, which lets you download um, uh, samples that you can then use. And they also had this rent to own program. So I um, used that to get a piece of software called Serum, which is like one of the most popular software synthesizers these days. So then I had like kind of the three legs of the stool, like like proper knowledge, um, uh, good sounding samples and good quality software. At this point, I'd also switched to Ableton. Actually, maybe I'll go back a little bit 
before then. So um, to talk, because, uh, you know, you and I met via EDM. So where did that impulse come up in me? Well, um, in like 2011, I think uh, my girlfriend at the time introduced me to this website called turntable.fm, which is now defunct, but it's basically like a chat room where you had your little avatar and people would take turns uh, DJing for each other. You'd get up on the decks and you could, uh, you know, select from their library of songs or you could upload some of your own songs. So, um, and her favorite room to hang out in was the dubstep room. So we would hang out there. And like, I just remember kind of having a similar feeling to when I heard Dream Theater the first time. Like every song was just like so crazy and over the top and felt like it was better than the next. And I don't even know how I was able to focus on my job while listening to all that crazy music. But, um, you know, they didn't fire me. So, I guess I I did all right, um, and I I tried post I tried sharing some of my early work there like, and it just I wish I could share one of them with you I don't know where it is but like this one song I made just sounds it's technically a dubstep song but like I didn't even know about side chaining back then and how important that is and I certainly didn't know much about programming decent sounds or where to get them so um, you know never really took off go figure. Um, but then that, you know, that kind of like, then I at least knew what, what sort of terms to Google so I could find more of this music on my own. Cause that was another case of like, where I was sure that the sound is out there. Like I'd heard snippets of electronic music before. Like I was really obsessed with that one Eiffel 65 song called blue. <laughs> uh, that was probably the first electronic music song that really got stuck in my head. Um, but, but yeah, so 2015 or 16 or so, I finally had enough tools and knowledge to make my first like, what I thought was good production quality sounding song. It was a remix of a speech from RuPaul's Drag Race. Uh, I'd finally been convinced to to watch the show. Um, and there's a lot of great clips and quotes in it. So uh, it worked really well for, um, for, for remixing. And then, yeah, I just kept... Um, kept making more tracks um i learned how to dj um you know got some got some djing software so i could actually um uh perform um in a in a setting um uh during this during this part of my life like during my 20s i was also going to burning man every year so that was that felt like it was very stimulating to my to my creativity and um uh, the la the most recent time I went, I actually like played a set in uh, for my friend's birthday party, which went really well. So that kind of like felt like a capstone of my Burning Man experience. And then, um, I know I might be going on a little long here, but no, take uh, your then... time. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm also you know here at Google. Most most um. The best social environment I'd ever had at a corporation. You know, there's lots. I think I started there when I was 26. There are a lot of, you know, young, similar young people moving from all over the, the world to work here. Um, unlike the unlike, say, the Googleplex in Mountain View, the New York office is centered around one building. It's grown a bit since then. But, you know, it's basically like a big cruise ship in the middle of Chelsea. Um, and so you're constantly getting to interact with all these different people. I had a really nice core group of friends and we would watch uh tgif every night that's like the it's like a weekly all hands where the founders of the company would speak and they'd like put out drinks and snacks for us to watch so like really felt a strong sense of camaraderie there um it was also great too because i could you know i lived so close to it so i could you know my commute was the best it's ever been like five minutes um i could take my friends to the office after hours and we could like hang out and play pool or um you know um, look at the hudson actually uh my first date with my wife uh was at the google office uh after like we met at this weekend party and uh, i was like hey do you want to come eat burrito bowls and watch the sunset from the 14th floor terrace and uh she was into it so um thank you google for um <laughs> hooking it up <laughs> Um, but yeah, eventually, eventually I kind of, I felt like I was hitting a ceiling in my career. You know, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd done one horizontal transfer to the, uh, augmented reality division of the company. It was called daydream at the time. And, uh, 
you know, that kept me going for a bit longer. Um, but then I just, you know, wasn't able to like, I tried getting promoted a couple of times, didn't happen. Uh, and I wasn't really sure how, if I could like mentally handle sticking around. So decided to shake things up, um, and join a startup because I felt like I needed that, um, kind of that different sort of experience. You know, I'd never worked at a, at a, at a very small company. Um, and, but now I had like 10, 12 years of engineering experience under my belt. So I felt a lot more confident that I could, you know, pick things up quickly and start making an impact in a, um, in an environment like that, where you got to move fast and you only have so much money. And if you don't, keep raising money or, you know, making progress, you're, you're just, that's it. You're, you're done. So, um, once again, talk to my friend, Nick, uh, he had a friend that he'd met in business school who was running the startup, Michael Abel, um, startups called Atmosphy. And, uh, he put me in touch there and I spoke with him. We hit it off and then, you know, I joined that company. Um, and I spent about two, two and a half years there. Um, this is also, <laughs> this was sort of after COVID had started. I don't think we were technically out of the pandemic yet, but um, uh, um, in any case, the company itself was fully remote. So that was, you know, we'd been sort of remote at Google. Like when, when the pandemic hit, we all just brought our laptops home and we're working from home uh, from then on. Um, but this company was like fully remote all the time. I only ever met one other person at the company in person twice, uh, Rosie Adkins, shout out Rosie. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so coming to terms with like not actually being able to see my colleagues in person, it sounds, it sounds nice. Like, Oh, you don't have to go into the office. You don't have a commute. You can just roll out of bed and like go to your desk and start working. But it also kind of like, for me at least started to, to wear on me, like creating this feeling of sameness, um, uh, throughout the day, like not really getting a chance to break things up and, and have a third, well, a second space really to go to. Um, so, uh, eventually I came to the realization that, Hey, I should, you know, this is a great, this would be a great opportunity to go on sabbatical, you know, take a break from working. I've been in the game for like 13 or 14 years at this point, saved up a good amount of money. Um, didn't, um, kind of was wondering like what like why what am I working this hard for if I'm not going to actually use these resources I've accumulated to to do something fun or interesting with it so and the the kicker is that when I was really making this decision I looked back at my journals from a year prior and I was already starting to like write about this kind of topic so it had actually been simmering in my subconscious for quite some time um uh so so, you know, I talked to, talked to Michael about it. Um, you know, I stuck around for a few more weeks and then I went on sabbatical of, um, uh, around Thanksgiving of last year. And, uh, that was great. You know, I didn't just, uh, sit on my couch smoking weed and watching Netflix all day. Uh, I ran the electronic music class at Fractal, which is of course where we met, uh, had, you know, that that's been a really validating experience for me, you know, getting to to, to dive deep into music and um, crystallize all of the knowledge that I've accumulated over the years and put it into like a solid curriculum, um, uh, which I've, you know, iterated on a couple of times. Uh, definitely saw my own abilities as a producer improve during that time, you know, having to make the same kind of beat over and over again, uh, <laughs> really sped up my workflow. And also this idea of not getting too fixated on specific ideas you know just keeping things moving forward you don't need to endlessly tweak tiny parameters that only you are going to hear if that um and um yeah so so that i guess kind of brings me to today I've, I've run the class twice now i've actually been uh interviewing to get back into the game um you know when uh <laughs> my living expenses have gone up a lot now because I'm paying for my own health insurance. And, you know, I've, I've, I've gotten a lot of juice out of the sabbatical. Um, uh, but I do, I have also realized like, Hey, I really do want to continue going deep on this computers thing. Um, it, it feels to me like, um, you know, it's kind of still a frontier of human knowledge. 
we've only really had modern computing for like 70, 80 years. I mean, not even really a century. So there's still a lot to explore. Um, and, you know, I feel like I'm in a great position to, to get to dive into that pool. And so I've been, um, you know, applying to various companies, uh, started hearing back from some of them. So I, that was all, it was all, going on a sabbatical was also kind of like a test of my own abilities. Like, can I actually step away from the industry for a bit and then get back in? Like, like, yeah, you can, you know, it's, they always say you're supposed to make sure to have your next job lined up before you quit your first job. But you know, that felt like kind of a limiting belief to me and I don't like to feel trapped and, you know, I, in software itself, you often like when you're when you're doing recovery testing, like it's not enough to just back up your data. You also need to test that you can <laughs> recover the data. So for me, this is like also a, a test of my recovery system. Like, could I jump back in if I were to, I don't know, lose my job or I wanted to go off and do something else for a while? And so far, it seems like that test is passing. You know, I, I don't I don't have a job yet, but all the um, you know all the signs were leading in that direction. And I think I'll have a really nice uh, YouTube video uh, for that whole experience once um, once I'm done there. So um, yeah, I probably left out, you know, a few things in my life, but uh, that that's probably a good overall summary of some of the highlights. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing your life like that. And all the details and different twists and turns and the way things connect to each other. I enjoyed hearing that. Thank you. Um, I'd love to ask, you mentioned pretty early on about, um, you know, this story about you preparing over the summer to get on the basketball team and that that's been kind of a recurring theme in your life of seeing something that you really want and then working to get it and, I'd be curious to ask about that trend in your life and what state of mind you were in at those periods and like what was motivating you and what, what values you had that made something like that, um, made you approach your desires that way. Mm hmm. Hmm. Well, it usually starts with me seeing something like I gotta, I gotta at least be aware that, that this is a possibility. Like I could be, I could get to participate in that, um, in the basketball example. Um, I guess I'd seen that, you know, in, in, in seventh grade, I, I kind of missed the chance to to try out or I might have even tried out and not gotten it. I don't quote me on that. I, I forget. But um, uh, I don't know. I think I'd seen the game and and the sort of density of of activity and, and energy in the game kind of drew me in compared to soccer, where everything's like much more spread out, um, probably. It also didn't help that a lot in a lot of my soccer experiences, we were like a very good team relative to the competition. I usually played defense. So there'd be like, there's this one season where we literally scored a hundred goals throughout the season and we had one scored on us. And so I spent a lot of time just at mid midfield, just like hanging out. Um, and I'm, and I'm like, you know, what am I doing here? Like, is this really the best use of my time? Whereas at least with basketball, like once you're in the game, it's like, you know, everyone's, everyone's got a role to play. Everyone, everyone's in, in the mix. Uh, actually, same thing with baseball, right? Like I would often just be in the outfield and I'd be boarded out of my mind because, you know, nothing's going on. I can't move things forward um, in any meaningful way. Um, hope no, hope you don't have any baseball fans out there. I really don't care for the sport, but whatever. Let's not get into that. Um, so, uh I guess, there, yeah, so initial, there has to be like some initial like feeling that something's missing. And, and then the awareness that, oh, maybe this activity could give me some of those things that I, uh, that I want. Um, so, um, you know, besides like practicing free throws every day in my, in my uh, driveway, uh, my dad also um, coached a 
coached a rec league basketball team for us with some of the other, uh, some of the other kids. So, you know, props to him for like, you know, helping his son, uh, achieve some goals of his actually he also coached our math team in in middle school so um been a lot of cases where he's helped kind of bootstrap me or, or bring me up um and so yeah having like you know the way internally it feels like i'm doing lots of work myself but i definitely shouldn't discount the uh the effects of people you know helping me along the way so like um getting into Google, for instance, I, the person that referred me was someone who I'd camped with at Burning Man. So that's like another kind of interesting connection there. Um, but yeah, when I want to like, when I see something that I, that I want and I want to go out and get it, um, well, maybe another, another example might be grades. So like in, in high school, I felt like I needed to get all A's and I pretty much succeeded. I think I got one B one semester, one time. Um, some of them got very high grades in college. I felt like, like for me, the, the clarity of that goal is one thing that helped me, um, helped me achieve it. Like I know what success looks like here. It's getting a hundred or whatever on this test. So, so if I, if I do, if I do what's necessary to achieve that goal, it'll help. So, so yeah, having, having a clarity, having very strong clarity on the goal really helps, you know, like get into Google or join the basketball team or propose to my wife. Um, <laughs> like having that, having that clear vision, um, helps, but there's often always this element of uncertainty. Like I don't actually know what the precise minimum amount of whatever I need to do to get that goal. So I always end up like doing more that like doing as much as I can or doing more than probably is necessary. Cause like if I try to aim exactly at like, um, you know, the minimum amount of effort needed to get something, there's a good chance that I won't get it. Like I won't, um, succeed. So, so like, you know, with getting into Google, I would spend lots of time after work, you know, after my software engineering job to, you know, practice these interview questions and, and keep, um, uh, keep building my skills. Cause I really didn't know like how much I truly needed to do. So I just had to go give it as much as I could. So, so to do that, of course you have to, or I have to not spend time on other things. So having, having a good amount of focus, um, is also necessary besides, you know, having clarity of vision. Um, one point on the grades thing though, I sometimes do regret spending so much time trying to get perfect grades. Like, you know, I think getting nineties probably would have been better because I could have, you know, put that effort to something else and maybe become more well-rounded. You know, I think one of my, I don't know if you want to call it a personality flaw, but I feel like I am highly adapted to a scholastic environment where you're passing tests and so on. But, you know, life does not present itself to you as a Scantron sheet that you bubble in uh, for better or worse. Um, so maybe I could, maybe the, maybe those kids who were, who were getting up two hours early to go surfing before school knew something about life that I didn't. <laughs> um, and I feel like actually a good part of my recent adulthood is, trying to undo some of that conditioning, if you will, or at least break out of this notion that um, reality is fixed and channeled. And there are like, there's a sort of like rule set that you need to follow. And, um, you know, if you do follow it, then you can achieve what you want. But actually, reality is much more fluid than that. And like going going to the startup also helps disabuse me of some of those notions too. like, you know, a big tech company like Google has a lot of processes a lot of hierarchy, especially at the lower levels. So, um, um, so your activity is kind of strongly channeled in that way, but at a startup, there's, um, you know, they talk about everyone wearing multiple hats. Oftentimes we don't even necessarily know what the most important thing to be doing is. So, um, so like trying lots of things and seeing what works is a good approach there. Um, you don't necessarily need to 
ask for permission a whole bunch to get sign off from a bunch of people. You can just kind of like do the thing. Um, you don't need to like rules can be helpful to channel your thinking, but they can also be limiting. So sometimes have to like, I sometimes catch myself noticing when I'm trying to follow rules too strongly or imposing a uh, sort of algorithmic quality to the situation that is mainly in my own head. And I guess it simplifies things, but, um, you know, it became a lot more freeing when I realized, oh, I don't have to expend energy, like following these rules so carefully, I can kind of do things, do things my own way and, you know, do it in a more fluid fashion. Um, so, so realizing there can be shortcuts to some of these goals is really helpful and, you know, that kind of makes them appear more achievable. Like if some goal is like way off in the distance and you feel like, oh man, I got to have to do all these different things to get there, then that might be a little discouraging. But if there's ways you can sort of like, you know, sidestep or take shortcuts, not like, not like ethical shortcuts, but just, um, uh, maybe you don't have to be as precise or rigorous in getting there, you can kind of do a good enough job to to get there. I know that kind of uh, cuts against what I was saying earlier about like, you know, if you don't know what effort is needed, then you just have to kind of give it your all and, and hope hope for the best. Um, so it's, I guess, a, a, a sort of balance to maintain. Um, what are some other examples that I can think of? Um, um, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll stop there for now. Um, I'm not sure how well I answered your question, but, uh, very well. Thank you. In there. <laughs> Do you remember any lessons that your dad taught you about how to focus on things that you care about or how to work at goals that you had or anything like that? Hmm. Well, I definitely saw him doing that. Um, so like at one point he was also pursuing a, a computer science degree as an adult. So he would, you know, go to classes, show up. He would, he would, uh, I remember him sharing with me this uh, battleship program he had written uh, for one of his classes. So, you know, having him in a, as an example of someone who puts an effort towards some goal, you know, I don't, I don't know if he actually got the, the computer science degree, but he did get an organ performance degree, which was, you know, very much in alignment with, um, you know, with his, his values. I mean, he can like, he's retired now, but he continues to play organ at, at church services and other kind of services like that. So, um, uh, you know, the, the, the big lesson I mentioned was maybe think just believing that it is possible. Like, like, Oh, if I talk to this person on the internet, they could actually do something really nice with them, which doesn't necessarily take take a whole lot of effort on their part. Like it seems like this huge thing to me from where I'm standing, but um, you know, from their perspective, it's like practically trivial. So um, yeah, knowing that a goal is possible, or at least feeling like it is, you don't even need to know it. You can just uh, um, perhaps you can even just assume that it is possible. And uh, as long as you believe in it enough, then you can uh, you can keep pushing forward there. Um, so, yeah, I'd say that's that's probably the the strongest uh, lesson that he he taught me. Hmm. Zooming out a little bit, how would you characterize how your own mind works, and and also like what it's like to be you? Oh boy. Um... Hmm. Well, I do like to approach things systematically. Um, you know, I've never, I've never been diagnosed with autism, so I certainly wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't want to claim that. I feel like in a parallel universe, I could have been autistic maybe. Um, but you know, from where I stand today, I don't, I don't think I have that kind of mind, even though my wife and I joke about that a lot. Like, like, 
my autism and her ADHD combining forces to create this uh, <laughs> explosion of power. Um, but I do, um, I do often think in terms of like images kind of colliding and intersecting with each other. Um, you know, if I'm, if I'm reading a book and I'm trying to like really grasp what, what the author's saying, I'll often like come up with these mental images that, um, that I can then like rotate and play against each other in their head, which is kind of ironic because, you know, the, my profession is all about writing symbolic language, you know, writing code that does this or that. Um, uh, I, I like to get a feel for things. So, you know, as, as much time as I spent in school, um, solving problems that have kind of well-defined processes for solving them or solutions. Like when I did, you know, when I would do these math competitions, you'd get these questions like find the radius of convergence for this integral. And there's like kind of a process that you can follow to get that. And so I was very you know, good at following those processes to get the answer and doing it quickly. Um, but that's kind of like, that's kind of more of the way a computer operates, right? You give it, you give it these instructions and then it, um, it runs through them and, you know, you get an answer at the end. Maybe it's right. Maybe it's wrong. Depends on if the coder wrote things correctly. Um, but, uh, that approach also feels, you know, ultimately feels limiting to me because, you know, you don't always know a priori what, how to solve a problem and you end up learning you can end up learning things about the problem along the way in your attempt to solve it. And it's also just, it's quite frankly, not as much fun to just crank through the steps of a, of a, of an algorithm. I mean, I guess, you know, I, I had fun doing those math competitions. Maybe partly it was because I was very good at it. Um, you know, there is, there is a certain satisfaction of like seeing all the pieces fall into place and then boom, there's your answer. Um, but when, when I got to the professional world, especially at Google, I really started to encounter the limits of this approach. Like, and this is part of why I said, like, I think, you know, I, I, re I regret some of my scholastic conditioning, like thinking like, hey, oh, you can, problems can be solved by known algorithms and just, you know, find the right algorithm in your library and you can, um, you can get the answer. But um you know, then you, you're only going to be able to solve problems that have already been solved. And so where's the, like, where's the value from that? And it's also like, you don't really get to um, uh, feel what it's like to um, engage with a problem as much. Um, like, I, school, at least the schooling I got seemed to denigrate the guess and check method. But like, in reality, that's often our best uh our best way of going about things like try something see if it works and it took me a it took me a while to kind of get over this idea that that's a bad way to approach things but honestly it's more fun because you're you know you're you're trying something and you're getting to play with it and um you know you don't know ahead of time if it's going to even work like you might have some some inkling that it could work and so you you know, you pull on that thread and, and see where it takes you. But, um, uh, you know, getting it's more enlivening. It's more embodied to actually uh, try things and then and then see if they turn out well. And you don't you know, you're not obligated to know ahead of time whether your approach will work or not. I feel like that also, you know, probably still trying to overcome that a little bit like you know, uh, if I don't know that this is definitely going to work out, then maybe I shouldn't even try. It's like safer to just kind of, you know, uh, curl up and hold back. Um, but uh, um, if if I actually do go out and 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 try the thing, even though it, you know, I'm risking my time and energy, and it might not work out, at least I'll you know learn something along the way. Um, actually, there was a I, I did a book club with some friends for this book. Uh, it was a machine learning book uh, called uh, Deep Learning. And, you know, I don't remember all the math from it, but there's one key idea that stuck with me, which is that um, when, you're, 
when you're exploring a domain, like new information is valuable to the extent that it is surprising. So like you see the same sort of data point you've already seen hundreds of times before, it doesn't really tell you anything. But if you see one new data point that's a bit different from what you've seen before, that is kind of inherently valuable because it like ex extends the range of your um of your model of reality like oh this is actually possible so um when i when i end up in situations that might nominally seem boring like um i'm actually about to take an amtrak train to boston like i mentioned you know four hour trip there and back um i've never ridden Amtrak before. So just the fact that I'm there in this novel space is enough to make it valuable for me. That kind of, I find that to give me courage and confidence, like, okay, even though this is supposed to be boring, it's actually, you know, it's a little bit different than what, what has come before. And so therefore I feel like it's not a waste of my time and I can, I can uh, enjoy it wholeheartedly. Um, even nominally bad situations like getting a speeding ticket. I mean, I've gotten, you know, I've gotten a few in my life, but um, it's still like a brush with part of reality that I don't experience that often. And so even though, you know, it's bad, I got to pay for the speeding ticket. At least I, uh, um, you know, got to experience something a little different than my day to day life. Uh, don't speed kids. Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, I've been putting my car in eco mode lately to um, to give me less reason to step on the gas really hard. Um, and that's, that's, uh, made my, made my driving smoother anyway. Um, but I at least like to, yeah, to go back to your original question, I do at least like to, um, build up some kind of model in my head. I like to write things out, um, in a lot of detail. I like to draw pictures to try to make the, the situation more vivid. I try to, I think I'm pretty good at like simulating in my head what something will look like as it plays out. So like I'm trying to learn a new recipe, cooking recipe. I'll like read the instructions and and visualize myself like pouring the cinnamon into the bowl and then mixing in the butter and stuff like that and trying to make it like really vivid in my head um, so that I can because uh, I'm always scared that I'm going to forget something or that I'm going to miss a step or that I'm going to overlook something. So probably to a fault, like I'd say in, in some cases, I probably spend too much time reading and rereading the instructions and I should just feel confident that, okay, I got it and I can figure out, you know, on the fly if I'm overlooking something. Um, but at least doing that, doing that upfront work of visualizing how it must look or how how it'll how it'll likely look when I when I approach the situation helps. Um, maybe one uh, one interesting example is when I moved into our house for the first time. I was trying to figure out how to turn off the water to our house because uh, it seemed like we had a leaky uh, hose spigot in the backyard. Turns out we just weren't closing this. We weren't turning the spigot in the correct direction. But um, so I got out my I got on my iPad. I was like taking pictures of the pipes and then I was like drawing lines on top of the pipes so I could see where they were leading. And I would like go under into the crawl space and do the same thing. So um, I really like using tools that can bring an extra layer of uh, visualization to the um, to the situation I'm looking at. It, you know, it's kind of goes hand in hand with this notion of wanting to bounce off the boundaries of the situation by trying things and then seeing how it how it feels or how I react to it. Um, yeah. What's your state of mind like when you're making music in Ableton, when you're producing music? Mm. Yeah. Um, I guess part of it depends on where I am in the song. Like if it's the, if it's, if it's like during the final mix down when I'm putting the finishing touches on everything. There, I'm like hearing the song pretty much done end to end, you know, making some final tweaks. There, I'm really looking for that feeling of um, of excitement, like, like yeah, I'm really like rocking out to this. Um, you know, I'm even like feeling emotional at the at the impact of 
of the sounds. I'm kind of like pacing around the room, listening to it on the speakers and just like um, focusing on those those tiny changes I made, but also feeling the um, the enlivening energy within me of the song and that that like like when I'm getting that feeling, I know I'm basically done. I'm pretty close. Um, uh, that feeling does come up in other, other places too. Like when I really get like, let's say I, I've got like a baseline going and then I, you know, add a drum, drum fill at the end and it feels like everything suddenly becomes glued together. I'm like, yes, uh, that it's kind of like a, a similar sort of, all right, we're on the right track. We're, uh, you know, it, um, it feels like, it feels like it'll have the impact that I want. Um, other times I, you know, there, there is some, there's definitely some guessing and checking that occurs there too. Um, like I don't, you know, I'll, I'll have some ideas about maybe like what a drum beat should be or what a melody might sound like, but I will have to uh, sometimes try out a few ideas or, or, you know, type out the notes, then hear it and then realize, okay, this needs to be nudged over slightly. That needs to be nudged over slightly. Um, I mean, I think I think being in Ableton and and work on music is a great exercise for um, for not trying to solve a piece of music by algorithm, but like really listen to it and and try to feel what it's making you feel, and you can use that as your guide, and then that you know helps me avoid spending spending endless hours tweaking little knobs that aren't doing a whole lot like um you know it, it helps me also to think of the opportunity cost like what what songs am i not making because i'm spending so much time like tweaking the reverb on this one instrument that you know doesn't need it so um uh but sometimes i will you know have like a very clear idea in my head of, of a rhythm and i'll just like you know print it up um and um you know, as I've as I've gotten better about it, like the music just kind of suggests things to me a lot of the times. Like I'll be able to feel where it wants to go. Um, maybe that's the muse speaking. Those are the those are the really like exciting times too, where you're not trying to where you're not like having to you know figure out what to do next. It's more like I can see where where this is going and logic sort of like artistically logically uh we need to have this kind of melody here or we need to change the energy in this way here um you know sometimes i do have rules that i can apply like all right um you know we'll we'll have this beat going for eight measures and then okay we need to bring up the excitement so let's bring in some hi-hats here um but then you know the nice thing about making music too is that you can always go back and and update things as you start to understand the song more. You know, there's definitely an element of discovery to it as well. Like, you know, the music is is in my head, but it's not going to hit me in the chest until it's actually coming out of a speaker. So, so, um, uh, so it's nice to like when you're doing that translation process from your head to the to the um, to the DAW um you get to see you get you get that surprising feeling of oh this is what i was i was reaching for and you know you get bet i've gotten better over time at like translating what's in my head into into ableton but there's always you know it's a different medium so you end up with um i think you always end up surprising yourselves and then too like a lot of my musicality is has been programmed into my my actual hands so like I'll need to play things on the keyboard and that won't even be very um, conscious. Like I'll know what key I'm in. Maybe I'll know what notes I want to start on. Um, but, you know, and, and it ends up being like a, a, a journey of self-discovery there as well. Cause I'm not like preemptively planning to play certain notes. It's just what happens when my hand is on the keys and I'm hearing this sort of, um you know back backing music and uh then maybe I'll you know go in and like edit edit some of the notes if I want to do something a little different but um you know there's 
it's not, it's definitely not like I already have a full fledged vision in my head and I'm just going to like type it all out. Um, it, it definitely evolves over time. Um, and that's part of why using loops can be so nice. Cause then it kind of helps, uh, kind of helps jumpstart those, um, those processes inside. Um, cause the blank, the blank canvas problem is real. Like, you know, I've, I've, uh, you know, me having heard so much music over time in various genres, like I can get something on, I can get something down that will probably work. Um, but there's like a clear um, stepwise change when you're, when you already have something down and you're like building on top of it. So I often like to, um, if it, even if I'm not, not using a loop, I like to start with just like the most salient idea in my head. Cause once I get that down, then the rest of the music sort of like spreads out from that and I can um, kind of it'll it'll kickstart that natural evolutionary expansion process of the music um, yeah what makes you really happy with a track that you've created mm. um, well I know a track is ready to submit when I can't when I can't think of anything else left to change. Um, now, sometimes it'll happen that I'll, I'll like get really deep into a mixing session and I will think that there's nothing more to be changed. And then I'll listen to it the next day and then I'll start to, uh, you know, certain bits will start to annoy me. <laughs> so then I know I have to go in and fix those or I'll, I'll never be able to like listen to the song on my own because I honestly I'm probably going to be the one listening to my music the most <laughs> uh so I really I I myself really need to be satisfied with it and uh um so so yeah I, I like I guess it's this sort of kind of like you're um rolling out your muscles like I I need to have fixed every sort of inconsistency with with how I think it should ultimately sound like I get the hi-hats are just a little too loud I need to bring them down or if the rhythm of a drum fill is just is not quite um uh in the in the pattern that I'm hearing I need to change it now I do have some more like uh hard and fast rules if you will or at least or maybe guiding principles is a better way to put it so um you know um, I don't like just introducing random sounds into a track because they sound cool. They need, I feel like I need to use a sound at least two or three times in the track somewhere. And this is like a way to create some internal consistency, some coherency. Um, you know, I, I break this rule sometimes for expediency or like there's just really no opportunity to bring that sound back. But in general, um, I structure my songs in such a way that I can have these recurring motifs, even if they're like very small, like even if it's just like one single sound or like one type of drum fill, um, the fact that I've got it here, here and here makes me feel like the song is is structured well and that I'm, you know, um, I'm not just making everything random, but I'm also not just making everything hyper repetitive. It's like this, it's like, the minimum amount of repetitive structure needed to create coherency without it being uh, boring. So, um, so like, so that, so that's one, one idea. Um, I like it when I can, uh, when I can have some like crazy synth lines with lots of notes. I feel like that um, harkens back to my uh, prog metal days and my classical music days. You know, I was really obsessed with, playing fast back back then I would like I would download guitar instructional videos from Kazaa even though I don't play guitar and I would just watch these guys like go duh, 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 with the metronome going in the background um and I was just you know fascinated by that for some reason really love watching the pianist's hands moving over the keyboard so if I can work some kind of like virtuosic sounding uh uh synth figure in into it I like that like in our latest track, we got that, that, that middle part has the cool, uh, line in it. Um, um, I like, I like there to feel like there's this clear sense of, uh, progression, like, like, you know, we start, 
we start small, we build up to a certain amount, we pull back and we build it up even more. And then there's like, at some point there's this like kind of peak moment. I mean, there'll be several peak moments throughout the track, but like, like building up to this most euphoric, intense, everything's coming together kind of moment. Um, I want to, I usually, I want to make sure that there's something like that in the track. Um, I don't really care for music that isn't, that doesn't feel like it's trying to make a strong statement. I mean, you know, I'll listen to low chill, lo-fi hip hop beats to study to when I'm, when I'm <laughs> studying or whatever, but, um, uh, I, I would prefer my music to like, you know, have a peak to it at some point. Like it, like it's like everything's coming together and, and like, you know, I, I so, so by that reasoning, I, I tend to like music that is more like high energy, um, you know, like metal or, or intense electronic dance music. Um, so, so making sure I have that in my tracks is important to me. It makes me feel satisfied. Like, yes, there's that, that one note that just is the absolute glittering peak of the pyramid of the song. Like it, it can, it can, it can literally even be just one note. Um, and, you know, I also like my songs to feel like I've improved in some way or like I've, you know, done better than my, my previous work in some way. So like, especially with our track, like the, the mixing I thought was, um, uh, some of the best I've ever done. It sounds like loud yet clear. So I feel like I've really mastered something about the 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 mixing process um, and and like how to how to layer sounds together so they fit well together and they don't fight each other. So feeling some kind of like 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 self improvement, like I'm getting better at music, is important. Um, and <laughs> sometimes like if if my music makes me laugh that that's also nice like or or cry for that matter like um like you know I'll, I'll hear an idea in my head like okay I want to add this sample here but it won't really become real until I hear it and then like like it'll make me laugh or in my song paradigm um my vocalist sent me over um some background harmonies that she used and I you know got them got them tuned up and dropped them in the track and I was just kind of playing it. I wasn't quite paying attention, but then when like the harmonies hit, it like like just suddenly brought tears to my eyes. I wasn't expecting that. So um feeling like there's these these moments of surprise, even though I'm the one making the track, shouldn't I know what's gonna happen? But it doesn't actually uh play out that way. Um maybe more so if I'm like giving a demonstration, but in my own music, like pursuing that feeling of surprise, I'll know I'm onto something uh something interesting there um yeah or i feel proud too if i'm able to like program my own sounds and use them effectively in the track i've always felt like um less than confident about my sound design abilities and, and like programming synths but you know I, I made this um this one remix where i pretty much only used sounds that i had programmed in the past i built up a nice library of them and you know putting them all together with the drums and everything i was like oh okay i actually do know what i'm doing and and some of that too is just developing confidence like like at one point i got i realized like you know listening to other professional tracks on spotify i'm like oh i could make that sound or wait that sound doesn't it's not as exciting or cool as one i would have chosen i think i could do better and you know, a lot of that came from experimentation and watching YouTube videos and, and improving my skills. But, but once I hit that point, I was like, okay, I, I feel empowered to use this sound that I programmed and I don't have to worry that because I made it, it's somehow not good enough. Like, uh, what's, how am I any different from these other people posting their music on Spotify? So, um, so yeah, taking these moments to where I feel like I'm demonstrating to myself that I've learned something or progressed in my skills feels very uh, uh, important to me when I'm making music. What was it like for you to work on this track, Rockstar, that we did together? <laughs> um, well, it was awesome. It was a great time. Uh, it was really, again, like I said, validating to have 
seen you progress in the the months that we that we were together and um you know to the point where you're bringing your own ideas to the table um because that's one of the frustrating things too about like teaching students sometimes is like if i start to you know they they bring me something or they, I, they show me their track and and they ask well what should i do here well if i start making all the artistic decisions then it kind of becomes my track and it you know uh, you know, aside from like the technical skills of how do you create a drum loop in Ableton, let's say the, 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 the meat of putting a track is all these thousands of artistic decisions that you make. And they're in some sense, arbitrary in the sense that there's no correct answer. And it's, and it's more about like, how is your internal artistic antennae, uh, vibrating when you, when you hear this, and like, where is, Where's your artistic sensibility leading you in terms of these decisions? So, um, you know, yeah. So if I have to, if I, if I'm like suggesting what to do next, then that sort of kills it for me. Cause at that point I'd rather be working on my own song. Um, but, uh, you know, with you, you brought, you know, a really awesome sample, the Lady Gaga speech. You even had, and you had some like great initial ideas with the loops. So, um, already I felt like you were bringing this amazing kernel of a song uh, to the table. And honestly, um, a lot of production, like you can do as much production as you want, but if you don't have that, that like key kernel of an idea, it doesn't matter how many bells and whistles or fancy samples you use. Like you're kind of just, making much ado about nothing. And on the other hand, if you do have like a strong, like key central idea, then it doesn't matter as much if your production isn't that great. Um, and so I think this is why producers like working with vocalists too, because the vocalist can kind of bring the key idea and then the producer can, you know, polish it up and, and, and package everything nicely. But honestly, the, the, the hard part to, to me, I mean, you know, granted I've, spent a lot of time developing my production skills but for me the hard part is uh getting that that one main idea that you then want to build a track around um and and for me no amount of production can make up for for that lack so first so the fact that you brought such a great idea to the start made me feel very confident that um that by the end of this we'll have something that sounds really good and uh Rick Rubin isn't canceled, is he? I, th I feel like we had a really oh, good. Uh, no. Um, I felt like you were you were a really good Rick Rubin type of figure in the session because, you know, even though there's a big you know experience and skill gap between us, you had the important skill of knowing when enough is enough, when to keep things simple, you know, when to avoid overproducing and filling in gaps too much. Um, and that, you know, granted, we did have, you know, many hours in the studio together, but still it's a limited amount of time and and you don't want to, um, by the end of it, you want to have something that you can be proud of, or at least that you can ship. So, so you being that voice of, Hey, this is, this is fine. This sounds good. Um, having that really well-tuned sensibility. Cause, um, again, if you don't know where, you're trying to take a track it doesn't matter how much how good your production skills are you could just be you know spinning your wheels or you know uh, applying techniques arbitrarily but the technique is only there to get you to um to get you to your final vision of things so um and i felt like we had a good sort of like pair programming style dynamic like where i was um you know we, we traded off occasionally, but I think I was probably in front of the the computer more, but that, um, you know, I think that that dynamic can be really helpful because then one person's mind is sort of engaged with the more technical aspects of putting the track together. The other person's mind can be in a somewhat different headspace. And then you get this nice, um, I don't, I don't know if you call it creative tension, but more like you're, it's not just more of the same it's like two orthogonal points of view that are coming together to synthesize something unique between there between them um though that said i do often i will often get ideas in the process of uh applying the production techniques so 
you know, I'm not always so great at just like coming up with ideas if I'm not somehow embodied with with the music uh, production um, interfaces. Uh, that's again why the piano is helpful. Um, but that's also why I encourage people in the class to like use their voice to record ideas or tap out rhythms on their on their uh, table or you know I think I think a lot of people have music within them. And now that we have portable microphones and um, that we carry around with us, we can capture those moments and then bring them into the studio and and dress them up from there. Um, so, uh, yeah, getting back to to what it was like to work with you, um, yeah, I don't, I, we didn't, we never really had any serious disagreements, so that helped keep things moving forward. Um, um uh, I felt like I could, you know, based on what you brought, n neither of us was like overtly committed to things having to sound a certain way. And so that also made the process more fluid. Like we could just kind of keep building on what we had and not get too stuck. I mean, there were we did go down some blind alleys. I think we we may have tried out some things a few times here and there that ended up not working out. But honestly, you can't. It'd be very, it'd be very difficult and maybe impossible. You'd have to be so risk averse that you never tried anything. Cause if you're not willing to, uh, fuck around and find out, uh, or do things for the fuck of it, um, as you say, uh, then you'll never, um, you'll, you'll never get to that final place that you want to be. Um, you're going to end up leaving something on the cutting room floor and, you know, you should be confident in your own generative ability so that you don't mind having to throw out some ideas. In fact, one of the best techniques is just to like come up with 10 random ideas and then pick the best one and go from that. And very little intelligence or foresight is is required there. Um, you see a lot of these production videos on YouTube where, they're, where, where they will set up some kind of uh, randomization synth and they'll have it create a bunch of patterns and then the human can go back and apply their curatorial discretion to pick out the best bits and then work that into a whole track. I think AI is that's, this is one of the ways that AI music can actually help the music process rather than just uh, disintermediating producers. Um, so, um, so yeah, working, working with you is great. We'd love to make another track sometime. Um, and I know you, like you had, you've been working with, um, uh aspen aspen yes mm -hmm. and so um i also felt confident that okay you've you've further honed your studio skills you know what it's like in there i'm sure you learned a thing or two along the way so that when we get together it won't be uh a waste of time or we won't spend all our time just like me teaching you things it felt like a real conversation and a collaboration totally hmm hmm <laughs> Say, uh, say that you do these interviews for different jobs and you go back into software. Is there anything that you would like to do to keep going with music? And like, what would, if you fast forwarded, say five or 10 years, what would make you really happy with the music part of your life? Mm. Yeah, I'm actually, that's one thing I'm kind of contemplating now on a little bit of a deadline because, um, um, uh, the deadline for teaching at fractal in this fall semester, or at least submitting the materials is this, um, is on the 10th. So, you know, I, I've, I've thought that I would, um, definitely teach the class again, but I know that, uh, one G is about to be under new management. I'm also going to be starting a new job. I assume you all get one of these. And so, and, you know, I did accomplish my sabbatical goal of teaching a music class. In fact, I got to teach it twice and, you know, really um, slim down the curriculum. So it's like exactly what I want to have in there. And on the one hand, it would be kind of a shame to, you know, have done all that work and then not keep it going, especially when we're at the, when I'm at the point where like, I have all the materials put together. Um, I don't, um, you know, need to develop the curriculum further. That part's on the rails, but, you know, there's still the the part about showing up to class excuse me, teaching it, traveling in and out of the city, 
sending out recap emails and so on. And, and I do like, I do like uh, improving people's, you know, musical consciousness, even if they don't become superstar producers like yourself. Um, it is nice. It, I, I kind of think of the class as like a kind of music appreciation class in some sense, like improving people's musical awareness. Um, but I think there's also something to be said for, um, you know, stepping away for a bit, um, maybe to create like some excitement when I do teach the class again, or at least, you know, letting the field be a little fallow for now while I, cause I'm sure ramping up my, at my new job will take some focus. Um, uh, there's still like one outlet that I have is my YouTube channel. So, um, I made a bunch of videos like music production videos for my YouTube channel. Um, the one about DJing, I was not expecting this, but that one has done the best. Um, probably seems to be because people are trying to learn the specific piece of software that I use called mix. Um, but I can continue my musical pedagogy there on YouTube. Like I know, I, I know, for instance, there's one, I need to make a video on, um, song structure. That's like the one that I, that I, that's part of my curriculum that I haven't gotten around to actually making a video for. So I could, um, you know, see myself, uh, continue to put out content on YouTube. Um, you know, I could continue making tracks on my own, especially now that I'm like much faster with it. Um, I, I, I actually have a couple that I haven't um, released yet. One of there's this uh, YouTube, uh, sorry, a Instagram account called Apollo and Friends. Uh, Apollo is this parrot, um, and I made a remix of some of his samples so I could you know make a video of that and publish it on uh, on Instagram. So. Um, I could see myself doing that more often because then I don't have to make an entire song. It can basically be like uh, a build up and a drop and then you know have a video to go along with it. You know one thing that I've also developed in the pro like during the sabbatical other than making music is uh, kind of having like a media production lab here. I mean, see, I got the the microphone and uh, you know I've gotten better at video editing software. so um, you know the the way, the way the industry is going, I'm not sure just putting pure music out there on Spotify or wherever is is necessarily going to be the most validating. Like I heard that 200,000 songs are published on Spotify every day. So the chances of breaking out um, through doing that are very slim. And, you know, I don't even necessarily know if I want to break out per se. Um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the joy of making music is um is in the process itself and and ending up with a product that's like hyper optimized to my ears that I, you know, that follows every turn and beat that I find enjoyable. And that doesn't necessarily require um, you know, becoming becoming famous. Um I guess I'm a little maybe a little concerned about AI music generation, but um, you know, nothing can replace that process of you, the artist going through all the steps and feeling, uh, the feelings that come up as you're putting together a song and, and, um, feeling like you understand, um, the structure of music. And honestly, like, you know, a, a, an AI can't really appreciate music in the way that humans can. So becoming a musician, I think is still valuable in that it like raises your, you know, a certain kind of awareness in yourself um it it uh stimulates certain structures in our brain that um you know make us a more complete person so um and incidentally i i the company i'm interviewing for in boston is suno which is one of the big ai music companies so i might continue my music track there professionally by creating an unholy alliance with computers uh and moving forward there um but one thing, um, the the social aspect of music has become has come more to the forefront of my mind as well. Like like making music by myself on a computer is fine. I've done it a lot, but if I get to have like a deep interaction with another person, like like you and I had in the process of making something, uh, that is like a whole new dimension to the music production process that I can't, you know, just get on my own. 
um, kind of similar to, to like teaching the classes. So like using music as a way to, to bring people together or, you know, to, to further deepen my relationships with people. I think that is, uh, um, th that's like a, a, an outcome that I would be satisfied with and would want to pursue more so than necessarily just like publishing more tracks that who knows if anyone will actually hear them. Um, definitely want to, you know, keep DJing. I uh, had some, had uh, a lot of great experiences there and, and uh, that's like kind of more easy to dip in and out of because, you know, I'm, I'm always adding new tracks to my library. And when it comes time to play a gig, it's like an opportunity to, con to consolidate everything that I've um, accumulated in the past, you know, several months or whatever. And at the end of it, I always end up with a new DJ set that I can listen to on a plane when I don't have uh, internet um, or I can play it at a party or whatever. Um, so, so yeah, probably not gonna just make like pure music by myself to publish, but finding ways to use music to connect with other people or to further my broader um, media creation abilities, like especially with video or to help bring people up to my level of music awareness and, and consciousness. Um, I think those kind of activities are where, where I would put my energies over the next like five to 10 years. Hmm. May it be so. I'm especially, oh, I, I'm <laughs> especially thinking of uh, our friend Cap Slap, who I hmm. talked to, who uh, recently decided to um, quit his 15 year career in the industry to pursue coaching. Um, you know, he, you know, even someone as accomplished as him and who was influential to me in the early days of turntable.fm, uh, uh, you know, he hit this, he hit a sort of wall that you know uh, resonates with me as well like the limits of just making music for other people um and you know it, it can be quite a grind even like unless you're at the maybe very tippy top uh, of the industry but you know there's a lot of um there's a lot of people trying to get that brass ring and you've got to put in a lot of a lot of long nights a lot of traveling i mean it's mostly live performance that um you know, pays the bills and makes it financially feasible. So, and, you know, for like philosophically, I feel like, you know, music belongs to the people. And so um, it's creating it is kind of like an inherently joyful act. And, you know, I'm glad that um, people can make a living off of it. Um, but, but for me, I think it's better to just have it be, you know, one of those things that humans do, you know, we're human beings, we we dance, we make art, we make music. Um, and, it, and it's enough for me to just, you know, approach it in that from that um, perspective. Beautiful. I love that. Mm. Seems really like a healthy, a healthy way to hold it. Um, so we've covered a lot of territory. Is there anything you'd like to talk more about or dive more deeply into? Um, yeah, I would be curious to know where you're taking MetaWave because mm. um, that was one of the, like when you um, asked to join the class, you submitted your application, you came in with a really strong idea. Like I've got this new genre of music that I want to make. And I've heard some of your sets, they sound amazing. Um, we've made our track together. You've made a bunch of songs with Aspen. Um, what's next for MetaWave? Where are you mm. taking that? How are you incorporating that into your um, into your your broader life project? Mm. Mm. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, I think my you know I spent and in the end I ended up spending four months in New York this year and. I kind of thought about that almost like, you know, I've done a ton of meditation retreats and when I did monastic training, um, there was the, what we would call the awakening part that was about meditation. And then there was the responsibility part that was about like leadership and service and learning to grow as a person so that you can be a benefit in the world. And I almost thought of the time in New York as like a responsibility retreat, where it's like an extended focus time of working on music production and then also cultivating relationships with people in New York and that sort of thing. And um, 
that was like pretty intense. Like I really went, I, I gave everything I had to it and um, that was really good. And then when I left in June, I really needed to rest a lot that month. And like the first couple weeks of that month were just like physically resting. Like I slept like 12 or 13 hours a day for a couple of weeks. And, and then the second half of the month, I felt more physically rested, but I still kind of needed to do this like internal reorientation and like almost like finding myself again. Um, you know, I was, I was in the suburbs and my hometown with my dad and just kind of like reconnecting to myself and what I care about and what I want. And, um, it's felt good over the last few months to kind of take some time off music actually, like after such intense focus and, um, also almost just like let that be on the back burner and, um, actually opened Ableton yesterday for the first time in a few months. And, um, that felt I was like, Oh yeah, this, I know how to do this a little bit. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I haven't been, I was staying with Aspen for a while towards the end and like was able to use her studio and, um, I haven't really been in a studio environment. I mean, I can do stuff just on my laptop, but it's much nicer to like, you know, like she had a push and a keyboard and stuff like that. So, um, and really nice speakers. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I've been really like focusing on fiction the last few months and kind of getting back into writing and, um, that's felt really good, but I think most immediately, um, next week I'm going to fly to Tennessee and, um, or I'll go travel to Tennessee and um, we're doing uh, an in-person event for the empowerment part of my work. And as part of that, I'll be running like an empowerment dance party, which is a little bit different than the meta dance parties that I do and more about people's like, I mean, to me, empowerment's about people having a vow or a life purpose and doing service projects. So that'll be really, it'll be kind of like a meta dance party, but with different themes. And um, I'm excited about that. And then yeah, I kind of imagined that over the years, I'll spend time with different musicians that I know and like kind of work with them in person and their studios and like collaborate on stuff. And I think I really liked that dynamic that you described of um, like being a little bit like Rick Rubin and like not having as much of the production skills, but really bringing like a vision and taste and like a direction for where things could go. And, um, you know, we had that and uh, Aspen and I have had that and I've uh, collaborated with a couple other people. And so I'd like to keep doing that and just like build my skills over time. And, um, and I think the vision remains pretty clear for MetaWave that to the extent that I cultivate music production skills, I want to use it in that direction. And, um, you know, I can still explore and do other things, but that's really a core interest in that when I'm running the dance parties myself, um, there's a specific like note that I want to hit of how the music sounds and what the vibes or tone of the, the dance party are, that's kind of hard to hit with existing music. Like um, there's like a few different qualities I'm really looking for and I can find tracks that have one or two of them, but all three, let's say is hard to do. So I, yeah, I'd still feel resonant to keep making those. I mean, I think a big part of it is that my one dancing is just one of my own favorite ways to, practice metta and loving kindness. And um, I did so much like seated formal practice and stillness in my twenties and my body's just like still kind of tired of that. And like, I don't have any of that with dancing. It's just like, there's good music and I love, you know, you really, I mean, it's kind of like self-inducing MDMA. You're just like happy and feel good. And um, it, it's not, um, it, it's just fun and it feels really good. So I'd like to make the music that I'd like to dance to at the dance parties. And um, you know, we'll, we'll see what 2025 holds for the meta dance parties, but I imagine we'll keep running those and um, do them in different places. And I, I enjoy that. So it's nice. And it, I don't know, it was really cool. And then at the New York dance party to finally have music that I'd created that was like, you know, with Aspen and be able to play that. And uh, that was like, I had kind of like a minimum goal for your class and then a stretch goal. And that was the stretch goal was to like create my own music that I played at the dance party. And then, the minimum goal was just like to feel comfortable in Ableton because it's kind of intimidating at first and just like what the heck is happening here. So, but like within a couple of weeks of the class, I like hit that minimum goal. I was like, all right, I can go for the stretch goal. And uh, thanks to your help and Aspen's help. And my friend Brent who gave me access to his splice library uh, and pile of credits. Uh, I, you know, I was really able to pull that off and yeah, I think I'd like to keep going. I, I we'll see exactly what it holds, but 
you know, I've got my iPad here and actually now it's been three years that I've been making visual art and like, it almost feels like, you know, I'm not, I'm not the best visual artist in the world, but it, there's a vocabulary that I've been able to cultivate over the years and um, like a skill set with that. And then I can bring that to other projects. Like one of the novels I'm writing right now, I've like been making some art for it. And that's really cool to like have my own art with its own style and like in the novel that I'm writing. And I think that's what I'd like to do with music is not have it. Like I love Fred, as you know, like I, it's not like I want to be Fred again or be Tin Licker or, you know, above and beyond or other people that have really inspired me, but I want to have music as a skill set that I can draw on for other service projects and like be able to combine them with my art or my words or, you know, in-person event planning or, or, you know, podcasts or something like that. The world is just going to get weird and I want to see what that's like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally feel you on the the joy of dropping one of your own songs in a in a DJ set, uh, even if you know no one in the audience knows it's your track, you know it, and uh, um, and you know getting to hear it on the big speakers is also a treat because we don't always get to play it on huge huge sound systems. Um, do you feel like the your Ableton technique is like riding a bicycle? Did it feel like when you opened it up again, you were like, oh, I don't know what's going on, or was it like, oh yes, my old friend, I know how to insert a new track and mm -hmm. program a drum beat well when i opened it yesterday i was um preparing songs for this set where like i kind of iterated at the meta dance party in brooklyn on even it was actually literally the night before the dance party I, I, talking to aspen about it, i decided to like put my samples on the songs and then like sidechain the um, song to the sample so that it would be more loud and then like EQ it so that like if there were weird noises, those would be removed. And I found that that just ended up sounding a lot better for using the samples that I like than just like playing them in the DJ set live. And it also kind of takes the pressure off DJing a little bit where I'm, if I do that, I literally just have to do the transitions between the tracks and I do transitions in a pretty simple way. Like I, I know more advanced DJs would be like, what are you doing? But it works for the Demented Dance Parties. It's like, I'm not trying to have the most technically advanced set. It's really more about that idea, like you're saying, and, and the vibes and um, that works well enough for that. And so I was trying to just get some tracks ready for this empowerment dance party that I'll do in a week and a half or something. And um, I wasn't full on making a track, but um, yeah, I think it's a little bit like, um, it felt a little wobbly just because it had been a little while and I still feel pretty new to it overall. And, um, but I think over time it'll feel more and more comfortable and, um, you know, um, especially as I understand more of the fundamentals of music and like have, um, like there was a point I hit in my visual art career where, um, like I have certain palettes that I use over and over again, and I have certain brushes that I use over and over again. And I like, made my brush set and I made my palettes and like, I could always use new brushes if I wanted to. And I could always use new palettes if I wanted to, but it was almost like between that and learning a few different techniques that I use all the time now, like I had a, the basics of a vocabulary that I could start to do the equivalent of like making sentences or paragraphs through my art. And I think that I have some of those pieces in place with music production now, but like, I still think there's like one or two missing pieces that I'll need to learn over the next few years that are like really like having an instrument that it's like um, that I can draw upon to go from, to like articulate an idea, bring it into reality uh, in Ableton. And I, I have definitely have some of those at this point, but I think I'm not quite at that point that I got to in my visual art career yet. Well, yeah, if you're revisiting it periodically you'll get like a natural spaced repetition style of memory training so mm. you should be thinking more over time and uh yeah your point about like having you know your go-to brushes and techniques uh I, that's a lot of what makes an artist's style their own it's like the all the tools and techniques they decide not to use because they're just gonna like focus on this circle like for me definitely the piano is is one of those like i think exactly very naturally, exactly in terms of piano melodies and even though it's you know, not the most original sound in the world. I know how to use it effectively. Um, is the um, is the meta wave versus empowerment dance parties? Is it mainly about different um, songs that you're choosing, or is it 
like different vocal samples you draw on top? Like what, what criteria change what you might play in one, one set versus the other? Mm. Well, we'll see if this is something I do repeatedly. I mean, this is our first time running this event for the empowerment mm. department and, uh, and, but yeah, some of it's just the context, like it's going to be, I think seven of us in the end that'll be gathering to like talk about service and our projects and how we can support each other and that sort of thing. And um, so that's one thing that's a different context than the meta dance parties, which are like a public event and they're specifically about loving kindness. And um, I think with the meta dance parties, like for 70 or 80% of it, I really want it to be like a very positive tone and like upbeat and encouraging. And, you know, I might hit more like, sadder or difficult notes, but those are always like flavored by compassion or Karuna. And um, yeah, I would use samples that are about love and about spreading love in the world or being kind or uh, what it feel, what loving kindness is or something like a, like a early one that I did was like a Robert Bea sample, for example, talking about loving kindness and the Brahma Viharas. And these ones will be more about like being a hero and being of service to people and, you know, something like a life purpose if I use samples and, um, yeah, I think I also have a little bit more flexibility with like which tracks I could pick than I would at a meta dance party. Like I'm going to play some stuff that's like pretty dark or um, like, I don't know, uh, just a totally different tone. Like I'm going to play our rock star track, for example, which I don't actually think of as like a meta wave track because it's not really it's not really about love or spreading love in the world. It's like, but, you know, it fits well with the empowerment theme. It's like I'm a rock star, you know, uh, so um, yeah, that'll be fun to play and uh it's, I also just love how like silly a track that is. Like I really came to love that. Like the like the room in the middle or, you know, I, I also just love the the sample from Lady Gaga, of course. Um, she's such a badass in that interview. And mm -hmm. um yeah, so it's, it'll just be a different tone and different themes and um it'll it'll feel different. I'll be drawing on the same skills and I think, but uh, for a different purpose. And that's why it'll it'll look a bit different. Yeah, that is another nice thing about EDM too, is that it can uh, cover so many different kinds of tones or moods. Like it can be funny, it can be serious, it can be heartfelt and emotional. Um, it's like this great integrator of of human experience. And like, you know, any any sound you can find, you can you can bring it into your track. You know, not so with maybe jazz or classical music. It feels the the sonic palette feels a lot more limited there. But so okay, so with the with the empowerment dance parties, part of it is about like, you know, having a different sort of audience um, and then being able to use certain tracks that you might not otherwise play. Like, like there is something empowering about really like a really dark evil tracks track. Cause like in stories, villains are often very mm. empowered, even if they're, you know, misguided, let's say, but they, mm. you know, they know what they want sort of, or at least they're going to try to go out and get it. Um, uh, and, you know, it also can make you feel like a badass when the, when the bass is raining all down around you're like yes i can do anything um and then too like yeah if you you could play even the same track but if you put a different vocal sample on it on top it completely recontextualizes it and and alters the message that someone uh might get out of it so so that's that's a great way to get more mileage out of a given song um well hopefully you you record those sets and uh, mm. post them online somewhere yeah, we'll see. It's it's interesting. I, I've thought about this before, but it, it occurs to me that like of the three parts of my love's, life's work, love, curiosity, and empowerment, I think empowerment in some way is like the least legible one. Um, mm. We're like spreading love in the world, like people get what that is, or like following your curiosity, people have a sense of that. But um, I don't know, empowerment and, you know, like the, the concept of a life purpose is not really in vogue in our culture at this time. Like it has been in, in the past at, at times, but I think by and large, uh, people don't necessarily talk about having a life purpose or what it would mean to follow yours. And we're kind of like trying to reconnect to that and and uh, in our own way. And I have to really convey what empowerment means to me and my collaborator, Mary, and share that with people. And you know, it'll be fun to do that through the, 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 through the dance party as a medium, yeah. I wonder if part of that illegibility of empowerment is that you you ultimately have to decide what you're being empowered for or mm. to do. Like love is kind of this, you know, by default, it's inherently good. You want more of it. But like with empowerment or power, 
it's like, well, what are you using your power for? So there's still an unanswered question there. Um, maybe, maybe if you experience enough love, that will come to you. And then you're like, oh, now I know why I want to be empowered. But um, I don't know, perhaps that's, that's part of it. Hmm. Uh, oh, yeah. And one other thing I was going to comment on was like, you know, you, you say you're working on a novel right now, you've also got your visual design going on. Uh, it is nice to to learn new artistic media, even if you never do purely that medium, just because it's all coming from the same, like, generative source internally. So if you learn, like, a new way of approaching that generative source or drawing upon it, then it can feed into each other, like, it can feed into the uh, discipline that you're maybe more focused on. Like, a lot of building a track is about, music track is about thinking what sort of world you're creating and what sounds would exist in that world. And, you know, same thing happens in writing. Like oftentimes if you, you don't necessarily want to just like blast out a plot, but rather create several interesting characters and then kind of push them against each other and then see how they interact. So, uh, you know, and William Blake, for instance, it was both a amazing poet and visual artist. So, um, you know, I, I wonder how many truly pure, you know, one discipline artists there have been uh, in human history that did something, something great. It feels like um, you can always, you know, whatever you learn by doing one artistic medium, you'll find some tricks that you, or metaphors, use, useful metaphors that you can then use to think about your main discipline. Um, hmm. I don't know if you've, you've experienced anything like that in your, um, in your journey thus far. Hmm. But I really resonate with what you said about it coming from the same generative source. And I think it's been a real delight to see that across different mediums and also um, see the variety in the way that that expresses itself through that medium. And um, I'm remembering pretty early on in my time in New York, I recorded this like dark DJ set that was um, like kind of different than my usual meta ones and had a bit like of this like narrative it was it was I was really trying to tell a story through a DJ set and I like put some of my own words like from tweets and stuff like that on top of the samples and um I was thinking of it a little bit like a, like a rock opera but through EDM and uh mm -hmm. I don't know that was when I think of that project or remember what it sounds like or the words that I used that's very similar to a lot of the themes that have come up in my novels or like a lot of the themes that have come through with my visual art. And um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's cool to have a sense of, yeah, really building a corpus of different creative projects that I've done and things that are really similar across them and things that are different. And um, yeah, to have music as, as a new skill set feels really important. I think I love what you said at the, at, at the end there about, um, it just being so human and it's like that's it it's like a, a fundamental creative medium and um really reclaiming that for myself as um a medium i want to create in feels feels really good mm -hmm. and maybe to tie it even back to an earlier part of our discussion uh mm. i feel like you know learning these different art forms can help develop your vision for what you want your world to look like which can then bring clarity to these goals that you that you may want to pursue and then it becomes that much easier to know what steps you need to take and you're not like uh there's no analysis paralysis or like wondering what what am i supposed to be doing again it's like oh i've i've seen what naturally comes out from me when i when i create art and so now i know where i want to where i want to take things in my life so um uh Bring arts back to the schools. Bring them back. The kids need it. Uh -huh. The kids need to have vision. We can't just be uh, utility maximizing automatons here. We have uh, mm. AIs and robots for that. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I don't know. I think in a lot of ways, being an artist is the, at the core of most of the projects I do. And sometimes mm. I'll describe it as being like a life artist and like my life and is the canvas that the art is being conveyed on. And um, I don't know, I, I don't think I saw that coming in my life that I was going to be an artist or that my life would be art. And, um, you know, I thought, oh, I'm going to be a monk or 
you know, maybe I thought I, I actually wanted to write the great American novel in my late teens. That was like an, you know, I want to be like a novelist and that was an aspiration or be a philosopher for a while. I wanted to do that. Or there are other things I was kind of captivated by the idea of, but I think if I had to put it into a word, like being an artist is really um, the thing I'm doing now. And um, I know Pilgrim's a good word too, but, uh, mm. or, or my official job title, guild master for the service mm. guild. Uh, there you go. But but yeah, artist is a really good word for it because um, that transcends most of the context that I'm in and, and, and weaves them together. Yeah. Maybe part of the challenge is that society frequently talks about the starving artist and we hear about it mainly in like through a commercial lens. But for me, being an artist is more about um, maybe seeing things that most people don't see or feeling things with a new kind of sensitivity or a different kind of sensitivity that most people don't feel and then you know whatever whatever your medium of choice is reflecting those those visions that you've seen those observations you've made or those um you know feelings that you felt and you know if they're clear enough feelings it doesn't matter if your art is bad or you know not not fine art or high quality it's like again it goes back to the idea of like if you have a really strong kernel of an idea for your song like you know three chords in the truth right as the saying goes that that'll take you um further than all the you know fancy sample libraries and and fancy outboard equipment can take mm -hmm. you um and you know culti cultivating this level of sensitivity and and awareness is uh you know that's that's invaluable across the board it's not just about hey can you paint this portrait of someone and get paid a hundred bucks and make your rent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel really privileged to not, um, to be in a position where I don't have to focus too much on not starving, you know, I'm, uh, because of my Patreon, people support me and, uh, sure. you know, other things. And, um, what is it? Yeah. It's interesting. I've been thinking about like the idea of a court jester recently, because, um, you know, the idea is that like a court jester can say the things that no one else in the court can say and because it's humor and that there's a kind of permission that's given through that. And I've been reflecting on that because of the novels that I'm writing and because of the process of writing fiction. And I don't know, I f it's, it's strange to me that I've been called to write about the things that I'm writing about, but I find that they're expressing a kind of truth through fiction, through story that I don't know, I, I certainly wouldn't feel comfortable saying otherwise, or, um, you know, most people wouldn't say otherwise. And then when I've shared passages with people, it, it's like, I don't know, I feel this like relief in myself, like, oh, someone's saying this finally. And then also um, I, I kind of get that reflected back to me so far from people I've shared early drafts with where like, it's not that the, the um, fiction so nice because I, I don't have to like literally endorse the thing a character says or does or something but like mm -hmm. even if i wouldn't fully agree with some of the things my characters are saying for example them saying it like moves towards the truth and i almost have this sense of um there is a truth that wants to be expressed or, or moved through and like fiction or or music or or comedy are really good mediums for that to come through because um I don't know, uh, like a, a philosophical treatise. It's, it's too, <laughs> it's too, it's too nascent for that to come through. And it's just like, well, what would it be like if this were the case, or how would someone feel about this or something? And um, you know, like creatively, phenomenologically, it really does feel like there's something that wants to come through that's being moved through. Um, it's like, all right, I guess we're writing about this, and I guess <laughs> this is. It's not the thing I would have like top down planned to. Um, to write about or something but it's it's what feels alive and what's being brought into the world so i think and i think music is also just such a wonderful vehicle for that um so, yeah especially in the love work i noticed that of like i i know i can write really beautifully i love my words but to really convey to someone a sense of what it means to me to love or to live a life of love i think music has done the best thing so far of really conveying that even beyond anything I could say or articulate verbally, because it really gives you that felt sense of, of, um, yeah. What, what does it mean to, to love? Mm -hmm. And music has a way of uh, bypassing the rational mind because it's mm -hmm. not 
trying to it's not making any concrete claims it's not immediately legible the way that writing appears to be um yeah it is it is more vibes and moods and uh mood based uh you don't you're not um i mean even with the you know frame of, of fiction writing you're still you're still using words so you're still kind of making weirdly precise but also very blunt um low resolution um artistic gestures whereas music it's like from from the get-go it's already going to be like this imprecise um uh, mood-based experience that um can can say so much more than maybe you know some words some some words can say um but yeah i like the idea of you know it's not like you're writing a humor novel per se it's just that the the framing of fiction gives you permission to be more experimental or playful or or say things that you don't necessarily agree with or you wouldn't like full-throatedly endorse but maybe like it's something you've observed even though it might be uncomfortable to to say like in, in a philosophical treatise like you mentioned you're kind of like claiming this is what i believe like otherwise why are you writing it mm. um it's very it's like what you see is what you get or um there's no there's no gap between the artist and the the art um it's like uh yeah there's no there's there's not a, there's not a lot of leeway to try to make tentative statements i mean maybe maybe with an essay you could or maybe you could like put a disclaimer on your work like you know epistemic status 50 percent or whatever mm -hmm. um but at least like with fiction it's uh even though you know a lot of people do try to try to politicize fiction and say we should only like make art about things that are also morally good or you know uh in alignment with the prevailing ideology um but uh that's not the way to great art in my opinion and it will block out huge portions of reality that we need we need to be aware of mm. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk more about or dive into? Um, I think we've covered a lot of ground today, so I'm I'm very pleased with this conversation, and I'm glad we got the chance to to do this. I know we both got busy schedules, and it can be hard <laughs> to find a two three hour chunk of time to sit down and <laughs> have a nice combo. But um, when it's with a good friend, I'll make the time. Mm. And thanks so much for coming on, David, and sharing your life and your heart and. I found this really nourishing. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Hope, hopefully we can uh, share the bill on a DJ uh, <laughs> party sometime. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> <laughs>